Hi, everyone. So far in our course, we have covered sentential logic. And sentential logic is really the cornerstone of our course and logic in general. So here's an example of an argument. And we're going to sort of see how it works with sentential logic. So all cats are evil. Frisky is a cat. Therefore, Frisky is evil. Now, of course, the question that we're most concerned with in general when we look at arguments is whether or not an argument is valid. And it's not very difficult to see when you take a look at this argument that, yes, it must be. But we have a problem with this argument. And the problem is that when we actually try and symbolize it using our sentential skills, we have some sort of abbreviation scheme like P, Q, and R as displayed here. And we just get a very straightforward argument. P, Q are our premises. Therefore, R is the conclusion. But you can see the problem. According to what we know about logic, this argument is actually not valid. The truth of the premises does not imply the truth of the conclusion. So we have this sort of mystery. Does this mean that sentential logic is somehow flawed or somehow bad? Uh, that's actually not the conclusion we want to draw. It's just that it's limited. Sentential logic is really important, but it doesn't have the sort of solving power to do everything we want. In fact, what we need is we need new tools to understand more complex statements. And when we understand these more complex statements, then we can understand and make sense of and assess the validity of more difficult arguments. So when we look at the cat's evil frisky argument, we can ask, what is really making this argument valid? Uh, is it the logical connectives that are in this argument? Uh, and you can see that the answer is no. One of the reasons why it's obvious is there are no real logical connectives here. These are just uh, plain atomic statements. And that's why we couldn't assess the validity using sentential logic. So what's going on is it's actually the relationships of the things within the statements themselves. And we can call these subsentential facts that is really driving the validity of this argument. So what do I mean by subsentential? Well, we actually do have some tools for this that you may know from some sort of English grammar course in your uh, past. Uh, so if we look at Frisky as a cat, you may recall that this type of sentence has something called a subject and a predicate. And a subject is, of course, what the sentence is about, in this case, Frisky. And a predicate tells us things about the subject. And a very easy sort of way to think about predicates is it sort of tells us properties of the subject. It bestows a property upon Frisky, in this case. Now, subjects are reasonably straightforward. They can be individuals or they can be quantities of individuals. So in this case, instead of just a single individual Frisky, uh, we can talk about all cats. And uh, predicates can bestow properties on either of these things. But predicates can also be a bit more complex. They can relate or tell us relationships or properties about more than one subject. And uh, that's, that's sort of a bit more complicated in logical practice, but is very common in the way we sort of speak and understand natural language. So what do we need to do subsentential logic? We actually need to add a lot of things to our sentential logical system. So we need a way to express individuals and quantities of individuals like we just saw. And we need a way to understand and express single predicates and multi-predicates. And when we put this all together, we get what is called predicate logic. Now, predicate logic actually has a bunch of other names that you'll hear or, or read in textbooks. You can call it first order logic, quantificational logic, predicate calculus. You can actually add calculus to pretty much any of these and, uh, and people will understand what you're talking about. So for our, we're not too worried. We'll just call it predicate logic uh, for now. And here is what we need. We need those things, the individuals, quantities of individuals, single and multi-place predicates. And just like we did in the first half of the course for sentential, we're going to develop our syntax, our derivation system, and our semantics so that we can understand. And this will really round out first order logic, which is the goal of this course. Where are we going to start? We're going to start with our syntax and symbolization. And from there, we'll move on and develop a full robust system so that we can understand and analyze even the most basic arguments that cannot be understood in sentential logic.